liberating music from hell. Francesco Latoro, or the maestro as he's known in Italy, gave up a professional career as pianist and conductor 30 years ago to devote himself to a single quest, traveling the world to track down and recover the music composed in World War II concentration camps. To date, his inventory tallies 10,000 original works, and that quest is far from over. Man can be arrested, imprisoned, persecuted, tortured, deported, transferred, or gassed. But you cannot take away man's freedom to make music. We've already lost most of the musicians in the camps. So if this music isn't played, isn't published, isn't made known to the entire world, it's as if it was never freed from the camps. Over the months of war and repression, concentration camps popped up on the five major continents. Hundreds of internment, transit, and work camps, both civilian and military, created by all belligerent countries, were added to the Nazi extermination camps. In Asia, America, Europe, millions of prisoners were taken. While all were different, each camp violated human rights and they all had one thing in common. Behind the barbed wire, at the heart of that hell, there was always a prisoner composing music. To them, the importance of that music was that it was written in the camps. It's the very notion of resistance, not allowing yourself to be beaten by people who want your physical and intellectual death. To understand the significance of that music, it was crucial to find the few musicians who survived the camps. Their experience would enable them to discuss that music and its true significance. Alexander Tamir and his wife, Brasha Eden, were the most famous piano duo in Israel. Yet it was a piece composed in captivity that made them famous. You see, this is the dangerous moment. It will go up in a moment, we have to catch it in advance. Uh, third was uh, the, the years uh, in Vilna. Uh, I, I was more or less uh, close to 11 years old. My father came to me with the idea that there is a composition and competition. Think about it in a ghetto. Now I'm thinking about it. In, in ghetto, the, most of the people were hungry and they were afraid of, of, the, of all this. Uh, of being killed sometimes, even, and the actions and whatnot. My father, he wrote the text in Polish. And the Rios had to write a melody to it. 
And that's the, 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 the words of Stiller, Stiller, yeah. that he wrote in Polish. Yeah. Oh, in Polish. Mm -hmm. And we sent both things to the competition. And then after came back the results that uh, the words and the music matching completely together. One can feel that it's written by a professional musician. The best performance I, I have. <laughs> yes, but it's important because it's the performance of the author. <laughs> uh, I can perform. Uh, I don't I don't see, it's probably the most important way of uh, enabling people to continue feeling that they are human beings, and not just a piece of meat. That's what kept them, I don't know if alive, but that's what kept them stronger. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. It was a kind of a religion. Yeah? It was a kind of religion. Yeah, religion, yes. Yes. You, the, you and all the musicians in the camps demonstrated to us uh, the power of the man of the intellect, of the art. Yes. You are a symbol for us. Mm, thank, mm. You. Mm. thank you. Thank you. Often without instruments and out of the sight of their executioners, prisoners composed groundbreaking music. Josef Krupinski, a Pole taken prisoner in 1941 for acts of resistance, was the most prolific of the camp composers. He said to himself, Yosef, you're a musician. If you want to survive in this concentration camp, you must devote yourself to music. So he finally managed to speak to the conductor of the Auschwitz Orchestra, Franciszek Nierichlo, and asked if he could play in the orchestra. And Kropinski, my father, quickly became known as an excellent musician and violinist. He was made first violinist of the camp orchestra. That's when he began to compose his first musical pieces. In all, he composed ten pieces. In March 1943, Josef Krupinski was transferred from Auschwitz I to Buchenwald in Germany. A group of prisoners from the camp suggested a workspace that was the only place he could continue to compose that music, music they considered necessary. It was the pathology block, because the pathology block was off limits to all prisoners and most SS officers. Not everyone had access to that block. That's where the Nazis skinned prisoners, tanned their skin, and tried to manufacture various objects from it.
È difficile immaginare It's hard to imagine a man che si si chiude in questa stanza locking himself up in this room at night mentre next to him was c'è un tavolo heaped with cadavers da scortare da sezionare It's an indescribable scenario. How could anyone write music in an atmosphere so unacceptable? It's hard to conceive what Josef Kropinski's days were like. But we can certainly sense that during the night when his work was done, probably in the glow of a candle, peacefully, he poured out a river of melodies of string quartets, of magnificent songs, and works even more complex, like an opera or an operetta. He composed more than 400 works here in Buchenwald. It's hard to imagine, but it happened. He experienced all that, the stench of rotting bodies. He saw the blood, the torn, severed body parts. And like the photosynthesis of chlorophyll, Kropinski transformed that deadly carbon floating in the pathology block. He turned it into oxygen, into life, into lymph, into whatever could contain the music. My father's camp buddies told me they called him Crackpot. They said he was engaged, insanely engaged, and did whatever he could. He devoted all his time to everyone, to all the prisoners, so they could help one another, so they could survive the most difficult period of their lives. That's why he was so engaged. That's how he mustered up so much energy to compose all that music. My father managed to say 117 scores, but he didn't live long enough to hear his music played in Poland after the war. Fortunately, as his son, I had that opportunity. I was moved and thrilled to hear that music and experience all that, thanks to Francesco, who is bringing his music back to life. Thank you so much, Francesco. Thank you so much. After he was freed, Josef Kupinski, like so many others, pushed away the ghosts of his past and didn't play his music. 
But for other survivors, music remained the driving force of their existence. For others, it even became a question of memory. He told me, when I die, try to do everything that people will continue, because they should know. This was his vision. Mr. Christoph, this is the original of This the is the Christoph. original of the notes which were written by my mm. father in the camp. This is the date of this of this event, yes? Ah, 20 mm. July 44. Mm. So your father was a devout Catholic. No, he wasn't a devout Catholic, but he was a Catholic. Mm. Yes. Yes. Then so na Scheißen Polus und die Warum denn do Afriki, du Kolonie Mam. Kupili cię chłopie, kupili z gnatami, krew ci z mordy kapie, ale szwajc egal. I Sachsenhausen. What my father saw in Sachsenhausen was terrible. People who were tortured every day, you know, murdered, crematorium burning all the time. So he wanted to, well, somehow to, 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 to bring mood, to bring some fun to, to his comrades. And he was singing for them. But he was singing, you know, just to, to, to be with them. But after a time, he met a Jewish uh, choir leader, a conductor. His name was Rosberry Darguto. And Rosberry Darguto gave him the life's mission. He told Alex, you are young, you are strong, you speak German, you are Polish. I think that you will survive. And if you do what I tell you, you will surely survive because the God will take you and bring you to the end of the camp and you will survive and sing our songs. And he told him to sing the songs of the Jews, of this choir, this, this famous uh, Jewish death song, Yiddish Todesang. <laughs> Prisoners came to him and they told him, Alex, I heard about it, maybe you can keep my song in your mind. And he tried to keep it. He kept 10 of them, 50 of them, and so on and so on. He also composed uh, own songs and he really believed that he is a living archive, a living testimony. And uh, you may believe it or not, but after the war, when he left the camp and came back to Krakow, where he was in a very bad condition with tuberculosis, in hospital, he wanted a nurse with the typewriter and she typed 716 pages full of text. These were songs and poems. So he started collecting music, collecting poems, collecting songs, collecting notes, collecting photographs, drawings, and he also recorded them. He's now assumed the responsibility of carrying on his father's work because he's opened his father's archives. I've met so many children of musicians who closed their archives. They've locked the doors to the pasts of parents who were military. 
politica, political and civilian prisoners uh, and had held on to those compositions. How many imprisoned composers' fondi, children have uh, lost scores, thinking it useless to keep them? How much of our heritage have we lost through their negligence? Christoph is an exceptional case. He's one of a kind. Alexander Kulisevich made good on his promise to play the music of the Sachsenhausen Jews for the rest of his life. Francesco Latoro has transformed his home in an industrial neighborhood of Barletta into one of the largest concentration camp music research centers in the world. It's the mainstay of all his travels and his quest. It's very hot in here. Today, I received three packages from Krakow, from the Kulisevich archive. This one's very interesting. It's a waltz. If all this music is to be played one day, we must do a meticulous job of reconstructing the scores. You can feel the bursts of emotion, moments of joy when you play the pieces. But when you're working on the reconstruction, you have to be like archaeologists in Pompeii working with extreme care and very scientifically. In a more it has a new sensation It's a B.O.W. creation The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor brought America into the war and moved the conflict onto a global stage. Both great powers opened concentration camps. The first citizens on American soil to feel the impact of that war were Japanese-American citizens. Like Mary Kagayama Nomura, she was 16. I really didn't know much about the world, but to know that my mother and father's country would bomb America, where it's our country, my, my siblings' country, I mean, we. There's no other place for us. And uh, we just couldn't understand. We were shocked, quite shocked, that it was something like this. And we had no idea what the outcome was going to be at that time. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, our West Coast became a potential combat zone. Living in that zone were more than 100,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, two thirds of them American citizens, one third aliens. We knew that some among them were potentially dangerous. Most were loyal. But no one knew what would happen among this concentrated population if Japanese forces should try to invade our shores. What are they going to do to us? They are going to incarcerate us, but where, how long, and why? Because we were a threat to America. After Pearl Harbor, America closed itself off. Four months after the attack, all citizens of Japanese origin were ordered to report to evacuation centers and could only bring what they could carry in their hands. Turning themselves over to the army, they left behind their homes, possessions, 
and professional lives for unknown destinations. They put us all into a bus, took us for our, oh, must have been eight hours drive to a place called Manzanar. And when we landed there, all we saw was black tar paper covered barrack buildings. And they said, this is your home, get off the bus. You're gonna live here. The hasty deportation of 110,000 Japanese Americans was a strategic choice. 10 concentration camps were set up in the most inhospitable areas of the United States, out of contact with the outside world. In the middle of the desert, between the Sierra Nevada and Death Valley, 11,000 people were held in the Manzanar camp for three years. I didn't know how to speak Japanese, so when I went to camp and I saw a sea of Japanese people, um, a shock. We were behind barbed wire. What can you do against the government? But there were very, very many people in camp who were against it and did a, had a lot of rioting and, and some of them were troublemakers and some of them, but really, they were really intent on showing that this is not fair. Without radios or newspapers, the prisoners were cut off from the world at war and submitted to constant anti-Japanese propaganda to prevent any kind of sympathy with the enemy. Being that I was only 16, I said, well, we're here, what can we do about it? I, people thought that Manzanar or any camp whatsoever, all those tent camps worked terrible and only have horrible stories to talk about the incarceration. I know, granted, it was. To diffuse tensions, the military allowed music to be played in the camp. Mary Nomura, who had a lovely voice, met Lou Frizel, a musician hired by the army to oversee young people. He eventually expressed solidarity against the arbitrary imprisonment. Writing lyrics that circumvented censorship, he and Mary composed Manzanar's song, which became a symbol of resistance. And it's a story about a young man's lament about the frustration of having no privacy, so he can't even court his girlfriend, can't take her to anywhere. And because everyone knows what you're doing, where you're going, how, who's going with whom, and... Do you want uh, Miss Mary sing? <laughs> oh, well. I know a boy and I know a girl in Manzanar. They try to feel that it makes no difference where you are. It's as simple as this, they're in love. And one private kiss they dream of. But when he goes to see her soon, the folks all go to bed but he feels he wants to remain. There's no place else to take her, to tell her that he loves her, and occasionally I've heard him complain. We dutifully went, not knowing it was gonna be a three and four year ordeal, being incarcerated behind barbed wires. It's something I can't forget. I'll never forget that. When they hear the buckets ring. Across the Pacific, the day after they attacked Pearl Harbor, Imperial Japanese troops invaded Southeast Asia, and the Brits suffered their greatest military defeat in history in Singapore. More than 80,000 Allied soldiers were taken prisoner by the Japanese. And I said to the man next to me, what's going on? He said, we're in the bag. I said, what bag? I had no idea. He said, we're prisoners. I couldn't understand it. That's why it was quiet. The fighting had stopped. And from that day on, I was a prisoner of war and uh, all the prisoners were in Changi. Then they decided to build the railway, Burma, Siam, and I was sent up on that job. 
The Japanese transferred 62,000 Allied prisoners into the heart of the jungle to build a strategic railroad, which came to be known as the Death Railway. The Death Railway was the largest forced labor camp in World War II history. Over 20 months of construction, it took the lives of close to 100,000 POWs and natives. The price was enormous, intolerable. Just get up, eat 60 grams of rice, work, bed. Next day, get up, same again. And that was how I spent nearly four years. Anything that moved, I ate it to stay alive. And that's how I was working on the railway, on the bridge over the River Kwai and the other bridges. On the bridge of the River Kwai construction site, music became an act of resistance. The prisoners took the melody from the Colonel Bogey March, composed during World War I, and added lyrics defying the Japanese. The famous song, uh, Colonel Bogey March, that was a, a version, a parody version that you sing uh, there. It's yeah, true. But the very rude words to it. What? The very rude words. The army song, the army version. Don't worry. Colonel Bogey. Yes, can you play for, for me? I can't, it's a, I can't give you that one, no. no. sing it in the barracks sometimes, even without the music. And we always used it. Of course, the soldiers invented rude words for it all. So it was a lovely uh, song to sing with all these foul, rude words. And the Japanese didn't know what we were saying, you see. Captured in Singapore, Tom Boardman spent three and a half years in the hell of that Thai jungle. He and Fergus Ancorn are two of the four last surviving musicians of the Death Railway. Yeah. I made a small ukulele. Some of the wood for the body of the instrument was made from Red Cross packing cases. The original wires are from telegraph wires. <laughs> Telegraph wires. From telegraph. Yeah. <laughs> and this notebook was made from, as you can see, from scraps of paper I could obtain anywhere. It's an improvised notebook. I'm, I write music, I write bits of music, chords, and diagrams show where the notes were on, on the fretboard. And that's a diagram of of the ukulele I was, I was making. Just a rough guide, that's all. It's better without glass, because my glass. This Chinatown is only um, Chinatown. Chinatown, my Chinatown. We made, we made Chinatown. Construction was delayed because of the monsoon. To complete the 451-kilometer route and reach Burma, 
the Japanese doubled their work pace. In exchange, prisoners were allowed to play music. There we started a concert party. And we used to do shows uh, every week. We had no script, but um, while we were working, we would make up a story and rehearse, what are we going to say? And then the night that we put it on, we were acting on the stage from what we'd remembered while we were working. And uh, we had a guitarist. He wrote some tunes and very well done. And uh, later on, we had uh, a, a man called Norman Smith. I think he was a captain. He came and formed an orchestra in Chunkai camp, which was a very good orchestra. And we put on shows there, which you could put on in London today, top quality. So um, I didn't realize it at the time, but what we were doing uh, was the best possible thing for the morale of the prisoners. Wampo was the worst day for me. I got very severely burned, a Japanese threw some creosote all over me and I was badly burned and sent down off the railway. And before I went down on a truck, I said to the eight friends of mine who I had been working with, my very good friends, I said, well, I'll see you later, you know, and he said, you won't see us again. And I said, why not? He said, we'll all be dead. Three weeks later, they were all dead. If I had been with them, that would have been the end of me. I'm now out confessing that when expressing my thoughts, words seem he made. At composition, I'm no musician, but you inspire a haunting refrain. Thirteen thousand Allied prisoners of war died of exhaustion, illness, and hunger on that line, which deserves its death railway moniker. The situation we found ourselves in, which was very desperate, of course, and he had to have the will to live, and music and songs played a big part in helping us to keep happy. When someone says to me, what did you miss most? They're usually talking about sex. I say, there's two things we missed more than anything else. The first one was sugar. The second one was music. Francesco's Death Railway musical construction site has just begun. London's Imperial War Museum archive estimates that prisoners composed several hundred works during their four-year captivity. Far from the museums and libraries, Another musical tradition remains to be found. The music of a people persecuted by the Nazis, more than a quarter of whom were exterminated. The Gypsies. They have an oral tradition and do not transcribe their music. Yet, it's an essential component of their culture. The Roma sing from the heart. They sing like they breathe. 
What we're going to find today is very important. Because these songs that come to us from the concentration camps would never have come without the continual transmission among all the villages in this region of Slovakia. The final musical repository. These villagers share the never transcribed lyrics and melodies of the songs their parents brought back from the camps. The Germans knocked us around. They hit us. That's how they were with Rom women. They desired them. They raped them. They did what they wanted with them because the women were scared. Husbands feared for their wives, too. They had to hide them. It was like that for four years. Everything we save has a tremendous value because all these works carry such enormous tragedy. They're not only valuable to musical literature and human creativity, but also to 20th century history and a history that factors in the artistic and intellectual creativity in the camps to a greater degree. To Francesco, hearing the music in public is a completion of his work in the field, a testament that it's finally been liberated from the camp. In the end, there's another form of music that holds a fragile place in our memory. Born of a non-religious Czech family, 
Jacob Garfine emigrated to the United States after the war. He became a film director known as Jack Garfine. He married actress Carol Baker. He was James Dean's friend and confidant. Marilyn Monroe's, too. He performed on Broadway. Here I am at the age of 10. That's my mother. And this is my aunt. I believe the only people in this picture, there are about three people that survived. I was among them, but... The, the, one of the most profound comments I got on this picture is from Marcel Marceau. Mm. When he saw it, he said, well, you look at this boy's face and you know what's coming. Mm. Jack, his parents, and his sister were sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau in 1943. He alone survived the gas chamber. At 13, he was transferred to build the Third Reich's underground industrial complex in Lower Silesia. He was interned at the Mars Bakhtau work camp. As kids, we were on the labor commandos, you know. And there was this boy who had the most beautiful song. Mm. But I loved that boy's voice. Mm. And I would always listen to him sing. And this one he composed himself. You know? Yes. So... Do you remember the name of this um, Polish No, name? I wish. I wish I did. But do you remember the, the song? Yeah, yes. of course, of course. Sure. It's... Tears mine hurts, kind hurts, von kein Menschen. Sie hab ich recht, ja zu leben oder nein. In Farwus kämpft man nicht, vor mein Leben zu genießen. Als mein Jugend soll er weg ein, elend jünger dich und wir. Sie ist mein Herz, kein Herz. Von kein Menschen, sie hab ich recht, ja zu leben. I'm sorry. In mid-1944, the Nazis gathered 615 Jewish children at Marsbachtal to make a supposed exchange of prisoners with the Allies. 612 left in that convoy, which, in reality, took them straight to the gas chambers. Jack Garfine was one of the three children separated from the group. So thought the importance of that song. And I don't know, the thought just came to me now that possibly it even helped me survive because I kept thinking, oh, mm -hmm. I'm the one that was taken out of the group. I have to remember, I have to remember that. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think it, it gave me, I just thought of it as I was singing it and I, you know, I saw the boy, the little boy's face and all that. And, but what's wonderful, in the work that you've done, Francesco, is that in the end, of course, it's the music that will survive. The first time Jack Garfine sang the song that had been locked in his memory for 71 years, he sang it to Francesco. It's now part of the almost 10,000 concentration camp compositions he has indexed. Francesco has already recorded more than 400 of them, so they will never be forgotten. Oh, 
Oh, oh, oh, oh. 